Hey, James here. Thanks for checking out this interview. Before we do start things though, just want to say that we're on the road to 2,500 subscribers and I would love to hit that target before Halloween. So if you could, please hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you get notified for future videos. And if you do enjoy this interview, please leave a like, comment, share, tell your friends. I would be eternally grateful. So thanks for listening to that and please enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to that 90s Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, James Sinstall. Today, join a very special guest, multiple time tag team champion in IWGP and Ring of Honor, X Division champion and a 24 7 champion, the one and only Mr. Mike Bennett. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. We're both sitting here in our cars, so I think we, we're like carpooling to work together. Oh, Dick, definitely. You're a handful <laughs> of uh, esteemed guests. Your good wife, Maria, she was a car interview. Uh, Todd Pettingill. And uh, who was the other one? I forgot who the other one was, but there was the two who sticks out to me. So, yeah, you've joined an elite club, you could say. Yeah, I, th- I think you might have a new show concept here, just like carpooling with wrestlers. Oh, we'll do some carpool karaoke if you want, by all means. Yeah, <laughs> no, nobody wants to hear me sing, trust me. I, I, I think of me as a less aggravating James Corden. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Oh, we hate him over here as well, not just American. <laughs> we hate him, we hate him, we despise him. You're welcome to have him in America. Oh, we can keep him? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So for everyone that is listening, this is a wrestling podcast. We're not going to shit on James Corden for 20 no, minutes. Not today. But, uh, not today. We'll do that another day. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. So how's it been there uh, being back in RH? It's been over a year now, but it must feel so great to be back home, basically, in RH with a company that respects you and all the great time you've got yeah man i i mean i've always loved ring of honor it was really hard the first time to leave but it felt like from a career standpoint it was probably the best thing for me to do um it's always been home the people there are home um the the talent the office i just i get along with so many people there and it's just fun they respect me they trust me and not only that but i'm, I'm getting to wrestle which is what i just yeah. wanted to do from the get-go i didn't i didn't become a wrestler so I could be rich and famous. I became a wrestler so I could wrestle. And yes. I, I understand when people say to me like, oh, you know, you should just appreciate that you have a job. And I get that. But at the same time, I, if I wanted just a job, I'll go get a job that I hate. I became a wrestler to wrestle. Like it's fun to for me. It. I love it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, I put my body through that because I genuinely enjoy it. So when I, when I, when I work for a company, I expect to wrestle. And Ring of Honor lets me do it. And that's my favorite part about it. And it must be great, obviously, t- teaming up with your best friend, you could say, Matt Taven. And Matt Taven, one of the most underrated workers in the world. Uh, such a great talent. And it looks like he's finally getting over this feud with Vincent, which has been there. Uh, pretty brutal. Vincent has not let him go. But um, what have you made to Matt Taven's improvement since you've been back? And obviously, Vincent, someone you know from your history, his complete transformation as well. Yeah, no, I mean, um, yeah, it feels like we've been stuck with Vincent for like the last 600 years uh, <laughs> and the, the kingdom hasn't really gotten its chance to do its thing. But it's really cool now that that's in the past and we're actually getting back. Like, I feel like we've had a handful of matches lately that really represent what the kingdom's been about. Um, we had the match against Rhett and Tracy, which was really like getting our feet wet. Then the match with the Briscoes really kind of got us rolling again. And then mm. we did, we have a couple of TV matches that I won't ruin, but everyone knows that the Bandito and Ray Horace tag match we have coming up, which I'm super pumped for people to watch. Then there's another one. I won't tell you who it's against, but it's, it's a really fun match. Um, and I really feel like it represents who the kingdom is. And it's just the, the really cool thing that's going on right now is both me and Matt are in entirely different wrestlers than we were the first yeah. time we teamed. So it's really cool for us to just kind of fit that together. We wrestle differently. We team together differently. And we're, we're two entirely different people. He's, he went on and became Ring of Honor world champ. I went to Impact and became X Division champ, went to WWE and did all the stuff there. And now we're coming back together as two. We're, we're, we're more mature. We know exactly who we are as wrestlers. And it's really fun to just have that confidence and then put it all together and then find out what the kingdom's going to be like going forward. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the kingdom, man, uh, obviously you mentioned the reason you, you want to be a wrestler because it's what you love and it's fun. Uh, former member of the kingdom, Adam Coe, he recently made the jump from WWE to um, AEW. And uh, 
doing some great stuff in OEW. He's teamed back up with the Elite and stuff. So what have you made of his move to AEW? Who Adam? Who's Adam Cole? I, I don't really remember that. No, I'm just he kidding. He died I, uh, on the YouTube yeah, show, but I, I he seems to be resurrected. <laughs> I think he might be hanging out wherever El Generico is, too. I think they might be hanging out in Mexico somewhere. Um, Kevin Steen, also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, you know what's funny is, like, I'm one of those people where I love watching my friends succeed. And just to watch everything he did in NXT. I mean, we always knew Cole was going to be a star. I mean, at, mm. I mean, we both got signed at the same time. And like, I was always like, oh, oh shit, this guy's going to be my competition at some point. I don't yeah. stand a chance. Like he's Cole <laughs> and I love him. I love him as a brother. He was at my wedding. Like I, I always tell people we our, our journey started at the same point. We got each other signed. And then we kind of just rode that ring of honor wave together. I'm so happy for him. I, th- and, th- and like seeing that reaction he got at AEW, seeing what he's doing with all, with all my, with all my other friends, it's just really cool. Cause we were all together in a, uh, in uh, ring of honor, new Japan. We all knew there was something special going on at that moment. And to see all those guys capitalize on it. It's like, I get goosebumps thinking about it because we all knew there was something special happening. And like, yeah. and now the entire world is seeing what's going on. And it's just, it's, it's really cool. And I'm just, I'm super proud of him and I'm really, really happy for him. He's younger than me. So I can say that I'm proud of him. Like he's like my little brother. So it's, it's yeah. really cool. And I'm just, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a really cool moment for him. Cool. And I mean, I know Ring of Honor is doing great stuff on its own and stuff, but obviously with this forbidden door, you could say being knocked down. How would you like to see the uh, kingdom uh, take on the elite one day? Hell yeah, man. Like, that's the thing. I, I think it's such a cool time in wrestling right now. We have all these quote unquote forbidden doors being kicked down, which I think is good. I think if you do it right, I think there's, there's going to be huge moments in wrestling that we remember forever. I mean, just the, like, just even seeing someone like Suzuki show up in new, uh, in yeah. uh, AEW, it's like, these are moments that like people are going to remember forever in the kingdom showing up to help out Adam Cole or to, to you know, beat the hell out of Adam Cole. That would be a moment that people remember forever. And I just, I love the fact that we've gotten to this point because when I started wrestling 20 years ago, that, that just wasn't a possibility. And then even as time progressed and like TNA showed up and ring of honor showed up and all these other, that still wasn't a possibility because there was one, one big dog at the top of the food chain and Mm. whatever they did, that kind of trickled down to everything else. Now it's not the case. And I think it's really neat that there's all these other companies that are like, Hey, you know what? If we just put our stupid egos aside and do what's best for the fans, we can we can actually capitalize on this and have something really special. And I think that's just a really cool moment to be in in this industry. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, and obviously you've grown up a wrestling fan, safe to say, kind of remind you of them territory days where the NWA champion, Ric Flair, would pop over in world class one day wrestling over there. Then the next time you see him, he's in Georgia Championship Wrestling. So... It's an exciting time, and I mean, obviously, WWE, you know, does its own thing, and we know that, but you, you can't help but fantasy book. End of the day, like, you know, I'm a fan. You're in the wrestling business, but you are a fan of the business. You can't help but fantasy book these kind of cross-promotion wars, you could say. Yeah, and I, I think, like, I, I think it's funny you bring up the territories, because I was thinking about that, uh, like, this month at some point, and I was thinking to myself, like, w- we now understand why the territories work so well, because Mm. at a certain point, the guys and girls in this industry do get stale in certain companies and it has nothing to do with their talent. It's just, you can only do so much. You can only win a world title so much or a tag title so much or a women's title so much before it's like, what else, what are you going to do? And then that specific company can only resign or sign new people so much. But if you get these opportunities for like, you know, for the Briscoes who have done everything you could possibly do in Ring of Honor to be like, all right, well, guess what? We're going to show up at AEW and we're going to wrestle the revival. Holy shit. We now have something we've never seen before and we can revitalize everyone's career and keep it going. Now you understand why the territories work. And it's, it really is kind of like a quote unquote throwback to it. And it's not the territories, but in a sense it kind of is. And I think it's the best of both worlds. Great. 
And uh, you mentioned TNA earlier, and obviously you mentioned leaving Ring of Honor for the first time and going to TNA. And I'll be honest, Mike, I love that miracle gimmick you had. Uh, loved the theme song, you coming out with Maria every week. Uh, she became like you know, the leader of the knockouts division at the time. And uh, you had some pretty great feuds. You feuded with uh, Drew Galloway, obviously Drew McIntyre, and you was the first guy to uh, pin uh, EC3 when he had these unbeaten streaks. So what was it like joining TNA and having this miracle gimmick? Because I loved it. Yeah, man. So joining up with TNA was kind of like my opportunity to try to tell everyone in the wrestling world, no, I can be a legitimate top guy. I can be a main main eventer. And that was my hope. And that was my goal. And I, I watching some of the stuff back recently, I was like, man, you know, you always hindsight's 2020, but you look back yeah. and you're like, wow, I was really on that trajectory. Why the hell did I leave? Like, what the hell? Like, but you know, hindsight's 2020, you get an offer from WWE to go right to to smack down or ever you're like oh yeah i gotta take that opportunity. yeah 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 <laughs> um but you know what it I, as i look back and as i remember it it i just i absolutely cherished my time there it gave me so much confidence and um and just getting to be in the ring with guys like drew or being in a high uh pressure situation with someone like ec3 who i think the absolute world of and i think is so unbelievably talented one of the more yeah. underrated guys in this industry um and then just being trusted that was the big thing i went to i went to impact and i was trusted um yeah not that not that ring of honor didn't trust me because they always trusted me but it was trusted as like we're gonna give you we're gonna put you with our top guy and we yeah. trust that you can help carry this company and that went a long way with me um and that was the moment like that gave me the most confidence i think i've gotten in wrestling in a long time and that was important for me to do um but you know, I'll always cherish that time. I loved it. I look back at that time and even that year and a half I was there, man, that roster was stacked at that point. And it's just really True. cool to look back. Yep. I was uh, th someone we don't really speak about that much, Dixie Carter. And she seems to have stepped away from wrestling or if she hasn't, you don't really hear much of her. But how was she during these times? So uh, I always, me and my wife always had a really good relationship with Dixie. Um, I think Dixie a lot of times gets a bad rap. Um, yeah. For this, I think I, I think she was trying to do the best she could with what she had, and mm. she kept people employed. She kept the company going. She did the best with what she could. It's an incredibly difficult industry, especially with someone who has no prior knowledge of it. Um, and the one thing I'll always say about Dixie is I always felt like she cared. Even when the crap was hitting the fan, I felt like she cared. And she, you know what the thing is, and this, and maybe this is why I, 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 I like Dixie so much is she was, after we left the company, she always reached out to us to check in on us, see how we mm. were doing. She was one of the first people that reached out to us when we had our first two, when we had our two children. When we had Freddie first and then Carver second, she was one of the first people that texted my wife congratulating us, asking how we were doing. Um, when we signed with WWE, she was the one, first person to reach out and congratulate. Like Stuff like that goes a long way with me. And I, I yeah. tend to be like, I look at people for who they are, not the perception of what the everyone else thinks. I, I treat people how they treated me. And she always treated me and my wife very kindly. And that always went a long way with me. Yeah, like I haven't spoken to too many people that deal with it, but the people who I have and Nick Holders, for example, nothing but, you know, nice words to say about her. So she always seems to come across as a nice person from the stories I've listened to. I mean, I would love to have her on the show one day. I, I can only imagine the stories she would have to tell. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, one one day. Um, but you made your way to WWE, and obviously it's been documented. You've mentioned it many times. Uh, but I suppose the question I've always wanted to ask, so like I mentioned earlier, I love the Miracle gimmick and the theme song, you know, the, the look and everything. Was there any talk of bringing that character over? Was it always going to be, you know, the Mike Kanellis uh, character you ended up having? Yeah, so basically, and I don't know if a lot of people know this. I'm sure they do at this point. Like, you really don't get a ton of say at what you do at WWE, yeah. you know, like it's, it's basically you're told what to do. Um, there was never any talk because it was never brought up because I was never asked what I wanted to do. Right. It was like, we're going to bring you to SmackDown in uh, a certain amount of time. Uh, the SmackDown creative team will reach out to you and tell you what they got for you. And, and that's it. And it's like, yeah. it's one of those things where they pitch the idea. And so as a wrestler and as a nerd for wrestling, 
being told that I was going to take my wife's last name, I thought it was hilarious because I was like, mm. oh, I know how people in this country think. They will think I'm the ultimate heel if I take the, my wife's last name. Because yes. For, so, for some reason, that means you're a terrible human if you're a man and you take your wife's last name because we're still in like uh, caveman times. Yeah, because that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's the worst thing in the world. Oh, my God. He's... He, took a name holy cow he's good like, <laughs> so i thought it was funny because i knew it would piss those people off um yeah. but i i don't think i don't think they ever had a game plan for it i think the no. idea of i think the idea was it'll piss people off to give some a male a woman's last name oh my god that's terrible shocking holy cow um <laughs> but i don't think they, i don't think their brains went any further past that I think that was, no. I think that was the stop of it. And so it was yeah. like, okay, we got to figure out something to do with them. Okay. We, we have this idea. Okay. Now what? No one has a clue. Um, so yeah, there was never any discussion about the miracle. There was never any discussion about what my name was going to be because frankly, I don't, they didn't, they didn't care. They were going to tell me what it was either way. Great theme song, Dave. Oh, killer theme song. I mean, <laughs> now I remember being there at money in the bank when we debuted and they brought us into the truck and they were like, all right, Here's, here's the idea we have for you. Um, well, it was actually, believe it or not, the idea for a love ballad was actually my wife's idea. Um, right. And she had, she had sent them an email saying like, I think we should do a love ballad, blah, blah, blah. And so believe it or not, we had a little bit of input in the music. Um, yeah. And so when they created it, they brought us in and they were like, here's what we're thinking. And they played it. And I just remember us looking at each other being like, this is amazing. This is the yeah. best <laughs> thing ever. And like, to this day, people still talk about it, so I know it must be something good. Yeah, man, you should try and buy them rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> cool. I don't think and so. I... WWE is going to be like, no, that was the only good thing we got out of him, so there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, obviously, you know, as a wrestler, I suppose, you know, you think signing for SmackDown, obviously that's the epitome of what every wrestler wants to be in WWE. But in hindsight, looking at it, and I'm, I, I'm guessing you would agree, would you suppose like the chance of perhaps going through NXT first before doing main roster, especially with, I don't know what your dealings with Triple H was like, but Triple H always, you know, loved the RH guys that came in and such. Yeah. So um, I always try to make this point because I want people to know it and I want him specifically to know it because I have a ton of respect for him. I always got along great with Triple H. Um, yeah. He always made time to talk to me when I asked for my release publicly he was the only one that uh, would allow me to call him and talk to him and figure it out. I always respected that about him. Um, he always got back to me with my text messages. Even if it took like a week or two weeks, he always got back to me. Um, yeah. I have the almost, he, he was one of the, the many, like the, the few people that like when I had my, my daughter, like talk to me about parenthood and like, he's a good person. Triple H is a mm -hmm. good dude. I like him very much. I would have loved to have worked for him more. Um, and, but you know what, the opportunity to go to NXT just wasn't there. It wasn't my no. call. It was one of those things. Again, um, I had tried while, when I was sitting around doing nothing in, at raw or at SmackDown, I constantly pitched to it, uh, pitched it to triple H and he would tell me like, that's a Vince decision. Vince has to give the okay. And for some reason, Vince would never give the okay. He would yeah. have nothing, have nothing for me, but on the same token would not allow me to go to NXT. Um, do I think it would have helped? I don't know. It might have. It might have not. I like to think it probably would have because I think Triple H has a better idea of, of what pro wrestling is nowadays and what's popular yeah. and how to use the indie guys and the Ring of Honor guys. I don't think Vince has a clue. I think he's out of no. date and out of touch. And that's just, I mean, the dude's 74. Like, that's going to come. Of course, he's going to be out of touch. Like, yeah. people in there, like, you, you, watch, you watch people in Congress try to it, it, like talk to these people at Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. They sound like idiots because they don't know what they're talking about. They're out of touch. But, it's the same thing with Vince and with Bruce Pritchard. They're, they're just out of touch. And it's, it's not a knock on them. They just, they don't get what wrestling is nowadays. They think what yeah. worked in the eighties and nineties doesn't work. It just doesn't. Yeah. No one, no one my age or younger gives a flying shit about that stuff. So it's like, it, I, Triple H does and I would have loved to have been under his learning tree because when you talk to guys like Cole or Tommaso or Gargano they all love learning under Triple H they all love yeah. learning under learning under Sean um, so it's like I regret that I didn't get that opportunity but on the flip side 
I do wear it like a badge of honor that I got to go, got to go directly to the main roster. Not many yeah. people get to do that. And I think that's really cool. And I get to, I get to like put that on my resume for the rest of my career. Like, no, no assholes. I was good enough to go right to the main roster. You know, it didn't work out, but I was still good enough. <laughs> to expand on that. Uh, I know we were running short on time, but to expand on that, what's your thoughts on the uh, Vince McMahon taking over NXT now and, Bring in uh, Pritchard and um, Kevin Dunn, I think he's brought... No, Johnny Ace, sorry. And with his NXT 2.0. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, it's one of those things where I just... I don't think they know what's good in wrestling anymore. I just... Yeah. They, like, it, it's... The proof is in the pudding. Like, I can't I can't sit through the show because I... it as As a wrestling fan, I don't consider it good wrestling. And so, like... They can talk about that they're going to, you know, spice it up a little or make it more, you know, rated R or or whatever they're going to do. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a pulse on what wrestling fans want to see, it's just not going to be good. And like I was reading something the other day that still said like the average age of the people that watch NXT is like high 50, 50 year olds or 60 year olds. Like that's not exactly targeting the younger audience. And again, I just go back to. What might have tar- what might have worked for the younger audience back in the late '90s, early 2000s, early '90s, just isn't what is going to be popular nowadays. You need someone that understands what what those age groups want to see, and unfortunately, yeah. I just don't think the people that are in charge there understand it. So, like, they can reinvent NXT 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, but until you get someone in there that truly understands what that age demographic wants to watch, it's never mm. going to change. You're just going to get like recycled clips of people saying dirty words or, you know, like, oh my God, yeah. we're edgy now. Oh no, my God, she said bitch. <laughs> oh my God, he said shit. We can say that now? Holy cow. Cool. They've been saying shit on, on cable television for like the last 20 years. You're not reinventing yeah. the wheel here. So like, <laughs> it's one of those things where, again, I think they just... They need someone that has a finger on the pulse of what's popular, and they just don't have that. Awesome. Cool. So uh, down to the last segment, uh, Mike. So uh, best and worst, we can rather say baby face and just say your best things. Or if you want to spice it up a little bit, you can say your worst things as well. So Hey, I told you, man, I'm an open book, so whatever. I don't care. <laughs> People either so... like me or they hate me at this point in my career. <laughs> oh, everyone hates me on this podcast. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Join the club, cool. dude. So, first one, who's the best referee you've worked with? Uh, probably either Todd Sinclair or uh, Kevin Keenan or Ref Hansen. Those are my top three because I love them all and I can't choose between them, but they've always been my favorite. Awesome. Who's the worst one? Oh, God. You know what? Probably no, like pick an indie promotion with someone that's training to be a wrestler and they're just yeah. like, we need a referee, get in there. A, a, a good referee can literally make your match amazing. A bad referee yeah. can tank your match. And I don't know if a lot of people know that, but if you're in there with a bad referee, it can literally make your match the the drizzling poops. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, part of this channel, we review uh, 90s WWE pay-per-views. Started off from Rumble 90, working our way through. Um, my favorite referee during this whole time has been uh, Joey Janela, Gorilla Monsoon's kid. And uh, I think, unfortunately, he, dro- he dies in a car crash in, like, 94. But yeah. watching him referee Brett and Bulldog at SummerSlam 92, what a job he done. Oh, um, yeah. A good referee is – it's it's a it's a, it's a a skill. And that's the thing. If you're in there with a good one, you know it. Cool. Uh, your favorite town to work in? Oh, God. It's – I mean, you know, I'm from Boston. I love Boston. Yeah, if it's hometown. not – if it's not my – if it's not my hometown – you know what? I love New York just because they always hated me and they gave me so much shit and I love them for it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, who's got the best hygiene in the locker room? Oh, God. Um, I don't know who has the best hygiene, but the best smelling wrestlers ever are the Hardy Boys. Ever. Yeah. They always smell amazing. I don't know what cologne they wear, but I want it because they, it's, yeah, they always smell amazing. That surprises me. Like, yeah. Matt, 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 you could see it, Jeff. I don't know if oh, no. would be more laid back, but no, that surprises no, me. No, <laughs> they, are, they are some nice smelling human beings. Who's the worst then? <laughs> oh, God. I, I don't know if I've ever encountered anyone that stinks. I mean... Vincent? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll go he with him. He doesn't wash his hair for a while. He's, he's a <laughs> stinky bastard. I'll go with Vincent. <laughs> uh, favorite producer or agent to work with? Uh, probably uh, Hurricane Helms. was. Uh, I worked with him at Impact, and I worked with him with WWE. He always gets the best out of people because he talks to you like you're a human. He talks to you like you're yes. a wrestler because he's been there. He's done it. He knows it. Um, and he, he has a great way of trying to get a, the point across of what uh, either Vince is looking for or whoever at Impact was looking for. So definitely him. Cool. Worst one. Worst one. Man, I don't. <sighs> See, this is a tough one because I don't like to talk bad about the vets because I have so yeah. much respect for them. So you know what? Um, we'll stay baby will... facing this one then. <laughs> no, you know what? I'll say this because I don't think he has a very good understanding of wrestling. Um, and I don't really care. I don't, I, I don't see what, what, what good is John Laurinaitis? Like, what has he ever yeah. done? He's the worst. <laughs> I mean, the dude rode a skateboard and he had cool hair, like cool. Besides that, I mean, the dude just probably knows where all the bodies are buried and that's why he has a job. Let's be honest. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, uh, your favorite fan experience. So rather yourself as a fan or an experience you've had with a fan. Man. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm just going to say I love. Um, I, I, I just love interacting with the fans. And I know there's yeah. a lot of guys and girls out there that don't. But to me, I've reached like we're all human. And like, I was a fan, I'm a fan of people, you know, I'm a huge fan of the rock. I, I yeah. like, I'm a huge fan of uh, like Eric church. I'm a huge, like we're all fans. And I try to remind myself of that when I'm having a bad day and like someone wants an autograph in an airport or something like that. I'm just like, no, they're just a fan. Like they're just, a, they're a fan of you. Like they like you as a person. And to me, I'm like, Holy cow. The fact that like, they just like me and they want my autograph and they want to take yeah. a picture with me. That is incredibly humbling to me to think like, to me, I'm just a wrestler. I'm just a dude that puts his boots on and wears underwear and goes and wrestles. And like the fact <laughs> that you want to stop me in an airport or stop me after a show so I can sign your piece of paper, it, that will never, that, that will never get old to me. And it'll always be humbling to me. Cool. And a couple more, Mike, uh, your favorite, uh, who was the best, uh, backstage leader you could uh, locker room leaders sorry oh i've been in there with so many man uh um, yeah this is a tough I one mean, <laughs> yeah it's just i mean roman is the best he's the man um I've i will go well. i'll go to the and that dude would watch our 205 live matches and help us after our 205 oh, wow. live matches which is like yeah and like would give us good critiques wouldn't be like oh you're you know you're, you guys are doing too much and no Genuine used to be like, hey, if you did this, but if you took a second longer after you did this, think about how the, and you're like, oh, what? Like genuine critiques to the point where you're like, oh, you're actually watching our matches at yeah. 10 o'clock at night when everyone else has left the building. Like, thank you. Like, he's great. Uh, the Briscoes, you can't beat the Briscoes as locker room leaders, um, especially in Ring of Honor right now. Um, yeah, man, I've just, I've been around so many, but those, those guys always stick out. I mean, the Briscoes are our ring of honor at this point. So yeah. it's just, they're the best to be around. Awesome. Uh, to expand on Roman, I don't know if you've been keeping up with WWE, but what do you think of his new character, uh, like being a heel? And in my opinion, he's doing the best work of his career. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, he's the best thing in WWE. Besides Tommaso, who I think is unbelievable, and he's one of my best friends. Um, but Roman, uh, it's just... He's one of the best, like he's untouchable right now. Mm -hmm. His work, his, his promos, his, his everything. He's, he's like, to me, he's, he's the epitome of like putting that company on his back right now without yeah. Roman. I don't know what I'd be interested in because there's, there's really nothing else in that company that interests me. But when I put him on with the Usos and with Heyman, I'm like, oof, that's something special right there. Like yeah. you just, you can't help but watch when those guys are out there. So I just, not only that, but again, I think the world of him as a human being. So like whenever someone's uber talented and they're such a nice human being, they're just completely over in my book. Awesome. Well, Mike, I've taken plenty of your time. Uh, but before we go, tell everyone where they can find you on social media and 
to everyone about the upcoming uh, RH events. Uh, I can't wait myself for them, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, no, just uh, follow me on Twitter at Real Mike Bennett. Follow me on Instagram, the Real Michael Bennett. Um, that's mostly where you'll find me. Um, and just you know, uh, check out Ring of Honor. Uh, we've been killing it this year. We really have. And I know it doesn't have the buzz as a lot of other companies, but like we're building it back up with the women's division yeah. and with the pure division. And if like if if wrestling is what you want to watch, watch Ring of Honor. Because we're like, we're 100% pro wrestling mixed in mm. with storylines, but it's always wrestling first and foremost. And like, go, please go watch some of my matches on YouTube. I've had a lot of matches I'm proud of against Brian Keith and Mysterious Q and Cole Radrick and Ryan Day. Like, there's just a bunch of guys that I've had these really good matches that I posted on my Twitter. Uh, uh, and I would love if people would go check them out. Not for me, but to look at the talent I'm wrestling. It's like someone yeah. like Brian Keith someone like Cole Radrick, someone like uh, uh, Mysterious Q, who are guys that I know are going to be the future of this industry. And I want you guys now to get your eyes on them so you can be like, oh my God, I was watching them when they were on the indies because they're going to be huge stars, I promise. Yeah. Another guy I want to mention as well, Eli Isom. Guy's got a big oh future. my God, he's so good. Eli Isom is, is amazing. He's going to be a, a big player in Ring of Honor and the, the, the pro wrestling world, I know it. Awesome. Well, Mike, absolute pleasure. And yeah, hopefully we'll do this again one day. Hell yeah. Thank you, dude. I appreciate you, man.